Welcome in the first uh, VR talk, and I'm very happy to welcome Pierre and Air mm-hmm. to both from Metaxu. And tonight we have uh, the wonderful digital and moderator, Isabella. Isabella obtained a BA in history and art in design in 2019, and uh, award and museum curating at the University of Sussex. A focus for our studies is on feminism, queer curatorships, looking at the way museums and gallery can be more inclusive to all. And I'm really excited to introduce to you Pierre, who's going to be our speaker tonight. Pierre is the co-founder of Metaxu Studio, a design practice helping people to take advantage of immersive technology in real-time 3D graphics. From architect and 3D visualizer to entrepreneur, Pierre has developed a deep understanding for the virtual reality industry. He has also been, obtained a PhD focus on spatial cognition in immersive learning environments. As a self-described B architect, Pierre takes pride in designing meaningful architecture and in enhancing people's spatial abilities to navigate the metaverse. Tonight, we are so excited to be in conversation with Pierre learning new ways of thinking about social VR and its relationship with architecture. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Pierre and his wonderful presentation that he's prepared for us. Great, thank you so much for the intro. But yeah, I'm, I'm very proud and very excited to this, uh, this first one-of-a-kind talk uh, venue here. It's a bit experimental, for sure. I don't know if anyone is with a headset here. But yes, someone, there we go, we got some hands, so that's, that's really cool to have back yeah, but actually most of this work and, and most of what I'm gonna be able to talk tonight is made with my uh, business partner who is actually behind the camera tonight. The, the point of the talk is really to explain a bit how we arrived to the venue and how we came up with this kind of design in the metaverse. All starts where really I was into and when we had the first Maybe the first uh, concept art of the, the sound of space and time. So this is the part from uh, the Tron, actually. And then obviously we know what it went on this very neo I'm not sure we want to, to be really doing this at the time, but that was what he was offering us. So there we go. And then obviously a big romancer who, who, who coined the term, from William Gibson, who coined the term cyberspace. With a, a, a small uh, quote here explaining what the cyberspace is, a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation. So that was the, uh, the start of this all, in a way. But then really, I, I, I was diving into this literature and, 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 and this cyberspace. And then you see there is another one, which is Snow Crash, uh, which is uh, showing what Snow Crash would look like on the left. Uh, later on, some other graphics more maybe looking like dystopian cities. It's really uh, in this kind of cyberpunk atmosphere. Is that really what the digital domain will look like? Isn't it that maybe some kind of looking more into what the material architecture will become in the dystopian? Maybe that's not really what we want to make out of the, the cyberspace. So another influence is uh, the time where we start to do uh, learning about architecture is um, the concrete architecture that was in uh, 95. It's got some really interesting picture of, of what this architecture could, could look like and obviously it would be something that evolve and uh, adapt in the user interaction. So that was a big influence at the time. And Marcos Novak is obviously very much uh, also I uh, really encourage you to read some text from this guy is uh, a vanguardist for sure. You could read some text 20 years ago and barely understanding all the concepts. But if we look at the uh, the more fundamental theory from philosopher, well, yeah, just a, a bit more inspiration and, and maybe with some very, just a couple or, or maybe three concepts that, that would support, if you want, the, the way we could design this cyberspace or, or metaverse from Deleuze and Guattari in a an amazing book, even reading just the introductions in that. It's all about uh, the rhizome, uh, to com- compare the rhizome, yeah. the yeah. tree. And just uh, two other concepts, and body without organs. I'm not going to go into much in this concept, but it's worth uh, looking into what it involves. So now, 
taking a different approach to this, looking more into the technology and quickly going briefly to the, I don't know, probably you are familiar with this or if you're not, I just go quickly through it. So first unmounted display was in the 1960, uh, then the first really experiment with a uh, proper unmounted display with motion captures because it was hanging from the ceiling and it was very dangerous to use. That was in 68. Then the first commercial virtual reality headset by the company from in 87. We see here, although this is an image from NSA, but, but really that was the hardware at the time. And they also, the hardware they use in the film, the Lawnmower, Lawnmower Man, or what it's worth. There is some representation of some kind of cyberspace there, very uh, psychedelic, I would say. Strange Days, always a good reference, not easy to find, actually, from the uh, German DVD. And then we go to all the software side of things. In 97, the first VRML 97 uh, standard, in where we were doing our uh, final year project, where we submitted a uh, 3D uh, interface, which I'm going to show you just a bit later. And then there is something there between the 1997, 98, and, and 2010, where there is a uh, no man's land into uh, the standards, uh, the VRML has been acquired and transformed by different companies and then it didn't work out. So we have to wait until the 2011 for the web, which is the WebGL, and then the WebGR done for the moonshot to the WebXR and Mozilla Hubs in uh, 2018. I think it's important to talk about this because obviously if we talk about the metaverse, it can only happen if it's all online, the internet, and the company has its own software that you need to download it. That doesn't, they don't talk to each other. It's not, it's very resomic, but is it that's what we want to, to go to? No, we probably want to have something like the web, but especially accessible. And so that's a bit what we were thinking already in 1999, where we designed this uh, library of the information age. Yeah, I'm just going to pass through that. And then the, during the, this, this break where there is no, no real software to, to, to go on with the VR and no real headset because it was very expensive until we finally had the uh, first of this in 2013, I went on working as a 3D visualizer, developing all the skills needed to produce those realistic uh, visual texturing, rendering, lighting, architecture. And at the same time, F2 went on to do architectural competition, the different office, and then also worked on the London Aquatic Center, where he designed uh, with very much detail the, the dives and, and all the back of the, the dives there, the walls. So this is definitely a project. And then we decided once we had the, the headset more accessible and once we had the, 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 these WebXR and the standards, that it was time to get back together and to see how we can actually now really create this this version or how, how, how we see the use of architecture to create this uh, idea. And so we working together to in that sense and we are creating the Metaxu Studio. And and so really to get this, we, we are now pretty good with the, the workflow we're using where um, F2 is doing most of the design in Ryano. Uh, and then we bring the model into a blender to do the texturing and to export it as and to optimize the number of polygons and to make it uh, as as possible for the web because that's one of the constraints. Then we bring this to Spoke, we do the mise en scène, so we bring the interaction, we bring the functionality we can bring into the uh, apps and linked to the standard of the web, web exam. And then we this space all together. Maybe I just before closing, just a closing thought, really look into is, okay, architecture, they've got a lot of constraint to build in the weather. To, so there is also a constraint in the real world. In the virtual world, obviously, there is no such constraint. The main constraint here is the weight of the files and the number of, uh, of polygons, but then actually there is still one thing that's very important is all this uh, human. And here we have our little avatars. Uh, if you have your headset, you obviously use your hands and you, you can move and you are feeling that you are in the space. 
I think that's really the most important is that whatever we do flow together it has to be around the body and has to work the, the interaction that we can afford, which is our hands and the voice and, and the eyes. And, and yeah, that's good. We could talk about that, but I'm happy to answer uh, questions and Okay, my first sort of question regarding your presentation, at the very beginning of your presentation, we met with very static imaginings of the metaverse, very technological, not really representative of the world we know outside, but this space with its curves and soft forms shows how we engage with the metaverse in ways that embody the outside world. What's the importance of social VR's relationship with natural forms and the way it makes us feel when we're interacting in these spaces? Yes, you're right. We, we are going for more organic uh, shape here. I'm not sure how to how to do that. I think maybe the way to, to, to look into this is why would we create rules like we are used to in the physical world? In the physical world, we, we have to work with the materials. So for hundreds of years or probably for thousands of years, we, we were just building with, with like wood and, and really stiff material. And so the best way is to go and just put them straight and put them in the ground and bring this verticality. So, yeah, this is the whole history of architecture to create, to, to build those space which are using some sense of some perpendicularity. And then once we are, once we have all the tools, the digital tools we, we have, and we, we find ourselves into this virtual environment, and we, obviously, we are not constrained with gravity, we are not constrained with this materiality of, of the technology. Yeah, it's very tempting to, to make things a little bit more fluid. And, and organic, I think it's, it's, if we look at nature, I mean, most of what nature does is, is more this kind of organic shape. That's why we use the organic shape. Something isn't in kind of parametric architectural design, more maybe ecological parametrical architectural design. Because when I saw first time in even that even uh, visual on Instagram on Evil Pride, it was clearly parametrical architectural. So because of that, I was going to ask uh, actually something same with the Bava. May I? Yes, of course. Thank you. So, Pierre, do you think is it important to build somewhere in the metaverse with the ecological parametric architectural design? And do you think do we need green on these metaverses? Even there, yeah. I, I, I'm also coming from the Deleuze and Guattari perspective. So even this space is actually simulation and it it's actually doesn't reflect our reality at the same time. But do you think do we need green uh, spaces uh, in the metaverse? Do, do we need green spaces? Yeah, definitely we, we're taking the direction of not replicating what we can find in the physical world. I don't think we need to, to replicate anything from the real world. The real world is amazing you know, and the earth and nature is fantastic. So the best way to appreciate it is to just go out there. So no, and look, when you see what, so the, the sculptures around here by artists in residence, oh, and which are really organic, obviously, as you can see, and maybe um, this brings enough of uh, an organic feeling that we don't need to bring more plants. No. You mentioned another thing, which is green. That's a whole other discussion about colors. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a, a very big discussion. And we, we have some, we have some debate with Ertu actually about the, the colors. So here we took some, we, we had a go at putting some colors, as you can see around here. But yeah, I think there is a lot we can do with colors and we still need to explore the best way to, to go about this. But yeah, that's, and to, to go back to the uh, metric. Our metric architecture. Actually, this is right now, obviously, it's using curves and, and nerves, but it, at this stage, it is not parametrical. So it's very ha handmade, I would say. We're not using too many scripts to, to create uh, these shapes, but okay. that's a direction we could take well, if we want to generate more space like this. Well, I wasn't talking about OK, but maybe all these forms also looks like something. Coming from like the rest of the so. yeah, I know it, it. It looks like, but actually, it is R two is a, a very conscientious designer, and he is he's not using grasshopper. But I'm trying to push him to do it. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. I 
got there, we have still a problem about uh, actually all those graphs because we have a uh, limitation about the polygons. Yes. Okay, we already know crypto works, but it is a space like Minecraft. But in Mozilla Hub, we, or in other space, let's say in space, they are actually more giving more aesthetical idea to the users. Yeah, I think that's something we probably uh, learn to, to work with is, is working with constraints. I think it's important with constraints, to be honest. So I think we need to take whatever constraint we, we have and, and working light and, and being efficient as we that we keep that constraint as quite valuable. Now from there obviously we know that computers can always improve and getting better and getting stronger. We we'll see how that evolves. Yeah. So, yeah. We don't know yet where where we can go is with all the so very exciting. Speaking of the way you're making this space, designing this space on Agora's page, we are advertising your one week boot camp. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you would, what we should expect from this boot camp if people sign up. Yes. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what I think it's really what we are talking about here, actually. I think mean, there is a, and the workflow I mentioned a few last slides is, is really, if we can, we, we've learned a lot for the last six months. To actually create those venues and those environments in a way that works on the web. And, and the idea is to share what we've learned so far and, and to show how we can use the open source software for most of them, maybe not piano, but Lender and Hubs and Spoke, they all open source software so anyone can use it, use them. Uh, and so, yeah, the idea is really to, to share our experience and, and, and give the tools to anyone who's keen to create their own space and their own venue and, and invite their own friends and communities to join the metaverse. Absolutely. And I know to so many of our artists who we represent at Agora, these VR spaces are so important in the way that they're able to show their work, especially during a pandemic and how, and how we can interact with them. How does these VR spaces, particularly for artists, work giving them the freedom to display what they want, curate their own work? Do you think that these are one of the best spaces for digital artists to showcase their own work? So do you mean specifically like uh, the platform Mozilla Hubs? Yeah, I think from, to be honest, there are a few uh, platforms out there. Even I've tried a lot of them. There are still a couple that I still need to, to test. But for as far as my experience goes, it is definitely the one that is the most accessible. Because every platform has a learning curve. If we, there is a lot of platforms like Allspace or, or, or VRChat that you have to download the software on the computer. You have to log in and you have to, and then you have to learn to do the, the space. And then obviously, if you want to bring your own assets in there, that's even more complicated. So, if, in regard of all these, Hubs is definitely the most accessible and the, and the easiest to use to just show here, like, I don't know, here, the, this image, you can easily um, manipulate any any image. Anyone can actually bring an image or a 3D model in, in the space uh, right now, which is quite an interesting thing. You, I, I invite you to give it a go. If you have a, a small JPEG, you, you can bring it in the space. Yeah, it's great. It's so accessible. And really, for all age groups, I've been reading up on your VR Santa space. How did younger people react and engage with the VR spaces that you created? Yeah, so that's a great example. One that really was really, once we've done that, we will say, okay, this is really great. We, we need to, to, there is something exciting there. So just to give a bit of context, we it was uh, November uh, and then we, we met this other other guy who said, oh, we people cannot uh, see Santa this year. Kids cannot uh, go to see Santa. So maybe yeah. we could uh, create an environment, a virtual environment, and, and invite them there to, to see Santa. So we did that. We created uh, on Slack, and we created the whole experience. We designed the whole experience. It was like a 25-minute experience. We hired uh, performer actors to play Santa and to play the elf that were welcoming the family. And so we sold uh, tickets and a family could have from one to five avatars. So they would go all together as a family. But most of the kids, they were on the, on the, and the, the experience of apps on tablet works pretty well. And so they were getting all, either on the phone, on the tablet, or maybe on the PC. And, and they were 
able to say hello to Santa, have a conversation with Santa in the space. Uh, and yes, yeah, so that was up to 25 families. And obviously we had a lot of good feedback and, and a lot of happy kids to be able oh, to bring in big motivation, big inspiration. Absolutely. Yeah. And it shows how it could be both the learning space and the space for fun and connecting. And yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. I would love to invite you all my first exhibition in the metaverse. How is all the If you have a link, you can actually just copy the link in the chat. Okay, that, of course. And then we can we can bring the link in the space. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have actually too many questions, but I don't want to bother anyone. No, that's great if you have questions. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, because when I just uh, discovered all this space, let's say, all these metaverses, I just followed Deleuze and Guattari, which is with the rhizome, of course. And it is interesting because I just saw the same idea on your, on your space, which is me and actually we are sharing, actually, and we are living in the Deleuze century, definitely. Mm-hmm. And of course, with the Foucault and the, also others. But at the same I'm wondering how we can actually decide all these, about all these buildings' ethics. Do you think do we need a ethical ethical perspective about the metaverses, a, about the, those architectural designs? Yeah, ethic is a massive question, and we definitely need to talk more about that for sure. But yeah, and the other question? Oh, my my another question actually. Yeah, we are talking about the rhizome in here, but at the same time, yeah, all this space also giving another another dimension and another reality to the to the people. Are you? But we are at the same time experiencing with our bodies uh, with the VR, but we don't have any effect to the outside, but we can affect it by the outside at the same time, maybe in VR. So how do we see the body is not separating from the space? And we have one of the class actually, which is the laws and space. <laughs> so we are looking all these experiences together. So body is important also. So how do you see for the future all these VR experiences uh, related with the space and the... But yeah, I think that's a great question. We, we are one of the first... So we, we're running a, an event every month, which is, uh, we call it in real time. And we're running that every last Tuesday of the month to actually... And we host the artist and we the idea is just to have a really a, an event where we can share this. So this space was the first was you with in, in the context of the in real time event. And one of the first we, we we did was actually an exhibition from an artist who who uh, photographic who, who present a photograph of a queer movie. And so we had these gigantic photographs of this nude model in the space. Uh, and we, that was also the, the theme there is really the question of the body in, uh, in VR. I think it's a, it's a super important question. But my, my, my answer to that or the way I see things is uh, I would love to, yes, there is there. Yes, we need to identify who's who, which in this case, yes, we have, we are, we have a robot. So maybe we don't know who's behind the, the robot or we don't know who's behind the avatar. So that's definitely something we need to, to look into. We obviously we can talk and we can maybe trust each other, but, but obviously, and, and this is a very, private uh, environment so we can imagine how many problems we can have when we don't know who's who behind the that so that's definitely a, a big question but then on the other end i think it's such a, an opportunity to explore how we want to represent ourselves in those virtual environments so like for me obviously i, I love having blue hair that's my avatar that's my, my way of representing myself there my, my way of identifying myself uh, and i think it, yeah, it's a great opportunity that we can that everybody could actually explore this and have different avatar, different identifi- maybe not identification, but different representation of, of themselves in a different space. I would love to see that more. And if if you I don't know if you if you can navigate into VR chat, VR chat is crazy the way you can create your own avatars. Um, I mean, I'm not that much familiar, but when I was in a PNL in Venice. I just tried one of, it was actually converting your body and it was when I put those VR glasses to my uh, eyes, I just was in the main side. In, in the main, main side. Ah. It is interesting because it was also giving a space for you to make 
it says, and I have saved in my main size in the uh, BNL <laughs> in the exhibition because it is another discussion, I guess, about all these by the experiences, of course. The last question too, but I would love to uh, talk more, so I want to come all your uh, events. I hope I can. Yeah, I'll send the, the invitation soon. Uh, at the same time, as, as I'm a master student in architectural history, and uh, uh, what do you think for the, these all these metaverses? What should we actually research uh, as an academician or about all this space? What kind of topics need to discuss mostly uh, in this era? So my, my my research that I started during my PhD is really more looking into what can we take from the symbol that we create through architecture? If we take up about, I don't know, the door, the window, the columns, the arcade, and my research led me to actually try to evaluate, if you want, the effect of all these uh, architectural elements on the way we behave in the virtual space. And so, so the clear architectural element is the steps, the stairs, and you can see that it works pretty well to keep everyone into this circle. But then we can actually use those stairs to leave. So that's one element. And, and there is another one, which is the, the ribbon here. And if we follow the ribbon, there is at some point a place where we, if you follow me, actually, we, we, can, we can see that the ribbon is maybe lifting up picture that can be that can be used in, in, with clever design and I think that's what we need to look into and there is a lot of space out there in those that environment that maybe are not so subtle and are just try to replicate what's already in the material world but we don't need a door here we don't need a ceiling there is no rain yeah. but we need gates to separate two space or we need a window maybe to stop us to go somewhere else but to see through so yeah this is the kind of I think yeah, that's that's another thing. So we, we have seen like all these open spaces. That's so great. Pierre, yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about future projects for Metaxi. What's coming up next? What's coming up next? So what we are really trying to do is, well, what we're working on is actually, so we, this, this is, we call it Meta5. There is five arms and it's great to host an event where we can have different artists that show their work. But we are working on smaller space and we decline them as meta one, two, three, four, five. And so because each one, like one arm, two arms. And so we, we're working on, on this, this smaller space. And the idea is that we would like to arrive at a point where we can propose in a way those space as templates. And so they can be uh, well then, or we are actually looking at what's the best uh, way to, to go about this, because obviously we, nobody needs to. But uh, yeah, that's why we, we're exploring the, the possibility of, of creating those venues as template that can be used by other artists or other in different use cases, actually. It could be an art gallery or other event, or maybe, I don't know, any, anyone that wants to create some event and, sh and show their work. Uh, right. so, sorry? So much possibility for these spaces. Can I put you in mind? I'm going to have to think about that. But mm -hmm. very exciting as we're partners, Agora and Metaxi partners, which will be working together very closely in the future. Does anybody else in the audience have any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you Thank so you much for this wonderful, insightful, insightful talk, talk and where we can really experience firsthand what it's all about and learn about architecture in the metaverse. Thank you so much. And Ertu, thank you so much.